I'm going to be reading a few scriptures this morning before I go into the word. Um, the Lord would um, help us. So please just um, come with me. Um, the title for my message this morning, which Pastor, uh, he didn't know what he did to my heart when he said, um, preach on biblical generosity. Yes. And I thought, oh gosh, <laughs> who wants to talk about money now? <laughs> But listen, um, let's just let God um, lead us. Um, the key scripture for today is taken from the book of 2 Corinthians um, chapter 9, verse 6 to 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 to 15. I'll read a few scriptures before we actually go into the word. So as we read the scripture, try and get an understanding of where we're going, okay? Because we may just dip in and out of it. Verse 6, and I'm reading from New Living Translation. Thank you. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each make up your own mind as to how much you should give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, godly people give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will never be forgotten. For God is the one who gives seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will give you many opportunities to do good and it will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched so that you can give even more generously. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will break out in thanksgiving to God. So, two good things will happen. The needs of the Christians in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanksgiving to God. You will be glorifying God through your generous gifts, for your generosity to them will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ, and they will pray for you with deep affection because of the wonderful grace of God shown through you. Thank God for his son, a gift too wonderful for words. Now let's quickly jump to Proverbs chapter three, and I'm reading from verse nine to 10. And it says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything your land produces. Then he will fill your bands with grain and your vats will overflow with the finest wine. Jump with me to, verse 11, I mean to chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 24 to 25. And it says, It is possible to give freely and become more wealthy, but those who are stingy will lose everything. The generous prosper and are satisfied. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Let's jump again. I told you we'll be jumping a lot this morning. Let's jump quickly to Matthew. And I'm reading from verse, I mean, chapter 6, from verse 1 to 4. Take care. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired, because then you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give a gift to someone in need, don't shout about it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and in streets to call attention to their acts of clarity, I mean, charity. I assure you, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone, don't tell your left hand what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in secret, and your father who knows all secrets will reward you. We're nearly there. Let's jump to Luke chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 38. Luke 6, verse 38. If you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, and running over. Whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used to measure what is given back to you. James 2, 14 to 18. Dear brothers and sisters, what's this use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith can't save anyone. Suppose you see a brother or sister who needs food or clothing, and you say, well, goodbye, 
and God bless you. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good, do, you know, what good does that do? So you see, it isn't enough just to have faith. Faith that doesn't show itself by good deeds is no faith at all. It is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, I can't see your faith if you don't have good deeds. But I will show you my faith through my good deeds. Amen. And finally, 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 we go to the book of Acts, chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 35. Acts 20, 35. And it says, And I have been a constant example of how you help the poor by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Amen. So, what does it mean to be generous? Let me read what I wrote down here. Generosity is the virtue of being liberal in giving. A generous person is friendly, helpful, and willing to see the good qualities in someone or something. Now, generosity is more than cash and you know, giving of things. When you are forgiven, when you are gentle to people, when you are kind to people, you are showing generosity of spirit. If you give others help or credit, that shows generosity. The most truly generous person is someone who gives silently without hope or praise or reward. Generosity begins in the heart. We belong to a generous God and he calls us to be a generous people. You and I only exist today because of God's gracious and generous gift to us all. Everything, absolutely everything, is rooted and grounded in God's gracious gift to us. And that gift is the gift of giving himself. Before we practice generosity, the Bible teaches us that giving to others intimately giving to others of our time, of our self, everything that we want to give is tied to loving others. Without loving our neighbors, without loving our friends, without loving our colleagues at work, without loving our brothers and sisters in this community that we are, even the grandest act of generosity will be meaningless. Love expresses itself in generosity. Amen. It's been said that we can give without loving, but we cannot love without giving. Our Heavenly Father was the first and is, remains the most generous giver of all. He expressed his love to us through his generosity in Jesus Christ. God has given you mercy in Jesus God has given you grace in Jesus Christ so that you wouldn't die for your sins because Jesus died for us on that cross. He paid for our sins with his blood so that we would not be separated from him so that we can spend eternity with him. So now you and I, we have a future. We have a hope. We have a light at the end of the tunnel and that light is that one day we are going to see Jesus face to face. We're going to enjoy him forever. So now, your sole purpose, my sole purpose on this earth right now is to image Christ through our obedience, our love, and our generosity. Every moment we, our life is a gift from God. He went above and beyond everything that we can ever imagine. We're all familiar with John 3.16. Let's say it together. For God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Titus 3, 4 to 6 says, But then God our Savior showed us his kindness and love. He saved us, not because of the good things we did, but because of his mercy. Amen. He washed away our sins and gave us a new life through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Not only is God a generous God in every fabric of his being, he also loves it when we are generous. Mm. Because when we are, we're simply behaving like him. So, number one, a given person will always enjoy a prosperous life. All round prosperity can never be complete without giving. The more you give, the Bible says, the more you receive. What you make to happen for others, God will make to happen for you too. Why? Because God is not any man's debtor. What you sow, you certainly will reap. When we are generous, all that happens is that our hearts is reflecting the God that we profess to love. God then uses that generosity to express his own generosity as he channels his resources through us. God has given us so many gifts. There's no graceless person sitting here. There's no one here without a gift. But what are we doing with it? Do we have clenched hands that nothing flows through? Or our hands open, our hearts open, our lives open, that God can put his resources in us with the confidence that we are going to release it to those who need it. You might say to me today, Ayo, I don't have anything to give, but I can assure you you have something to give. Yes, absolutely. You definitely have something to give. Now, God is not going to you know, someone needs a shoulder to cry on. Yes, the person can pray. But do you understand the significance of actually have, having someone to hold your hand, to hug you, and to say, sister, brother, it's going to be okay. That is part of the gifts that God has placed in us for one another. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. You don't wait to receive first before you give. You initiate the giving. Yeah. Whatever God has put in you, you be the one that determines to use it first. A farmer does not receive a harvest before he plants the seed. You first of all plant the seed, and then the harvest comes. And I don't know if anyone has ever heard of someone who planted a grain of corn, and only one grain of corn grew back. No. One thing is certain. Everything you give, God gives it back tenfold, hundredfold, a thousandfold. I'm not even saying that you give 10 pounds, it gives you 20 pounds. That's not the way God works. No. There's so much more that God gives us that we don't see. The Bible says the things we see, they're what? They're passing. But the things we don't see, those are the things that last, that are for eternity. Number two, financial giving. I know it's a very, you know, <laughs> delicate um, topic, you know. But it's one of the most powerful ways that you can make a difference in someone's life. Many Christians tend to shy away from the subject of money because it makes them feel uncomfortable. You know, and I know many times pastors stood here talking about giving and all that, and you know, even he said he struggled with bringing that message. But when he did, things changed. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, guys. We should talk about money. Amen. 
Everyone needs money on a daily basis. Even if it's your card you use, it's money that is in your bank that your card is spending. So we need money. So let's be, you know, let's be, let's be, you know, sincere and say, you know, there's nothing wrong with having money. The wrong thing about it is hoarding it, not letting go. Closing your eyes to needs, pretending that you didn't see or hear. Even when the Holy Spirit prods you, go and do this. And it's like, mm, get thee behind me, Satan, because you don't want to let go. You know, Jesus knew money had the potential to be a major stumbling block for us. And I tell you, you know, he did talk a lot about money in the Bible, including the fact that we cannot serve God and money. Okay? Choose you which one you will take this day. In 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19, Jesus said, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So everything God has given us is for our enjoyment. But then when I say for our enjoyment, is it not more joyful to you when you put a smile on someone's face? Is it not more joyful to you when you take care of a need and you see the difference that it has made in that person's life. There's no need to be afraid to give, whether in church or outside of church. When we call ourselves Christians, it means going out of our comfort zone and beyond to give of ourselves and not just our money. If we see ourselves as we belong to God, then everything we have belongs to him. So why would I say, Lord, you are mine, I'm yours, but my money is not yours. My time is not yours. My house does not belong to you. I live with a man for the last 37 years of our married life. Apart from maybe a week or two, there's not been a day that there's not been someone living with us. And sometimes for six years, for seven years, and they become our responsibility. And that's for all the time I've known this very generous man. There's nothing we brought into this world that we are going to take away with us. And even though I call myself the sane one in terms of our finances, I'm kind of like the keeper of the, <laughs> of the bank, <laughs> you know, I'm encouraged because if he has 10 pounds, he'll spend 9 pounds 99 on someone else. The sole reason he works is to help people, not because he needs it but just because he has a lot of help to give out there. And I'm encouraged by that. Giving never takes anything from us. It adds to us. When we are worried about what we have to give up, we need to think instead about what, what God wants us to gain through our generous giving. I'm sure many of you know the story of the little boy with the five loaves and two fishes. And God turned, I mean, Jesus turned that to feed 5,000 people. The Bible didn't say it, but I'm sure out of the 12 baskets they gathered, even if it's one basket, that boy took it home. And that basket was much more than the five loaves and two fishes that he brought. Ordinary money takes on supernatural power when we entrust it to the one who can multiply it for the good of others. Let me say that again. Ordinary money, that thing we are looking at and thinking, oh, I can't let go of this. What's going to happen to me if I give this? I haven't paid my rent. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. Ordinary money takes on supernatural power when we entrust it to the one who can multiply it for the good of others. For the follower of Jesus Christ, we call ourselves Christians, followers of Christ. Money is a tool to help to build the kingdom. Amen. 
God is blessed when we give because our giving helps to expand his work on earth. Listen, the gospel is not free. I mean, the gospel is free. But it costs money to spread the good news. It costs money to build the church. For those of us who came from the old building, I mean, see the difference. Mm. The, 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 the building didn't just <laughs> evolve. <laughs> we paid some people to put the blocks together and carry the stones and all that. These chairs you're sitting on were bought with money. The carpets you're working on were paid for. Bills are still being paid. Electricity, gas, everything. Air condition. Air condition. <laughs> Some are privileged to even have breakfast here. I want to join that team. <laughs> you know. So it's, 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 it costs money. God's work is great, but it requires finances. It requires people. The church didn't clean itself yesterday. I'm not, uh, it's not like I want you to know I cleaned yesterday. But I belong to Sister Elizabeth's team. And somehow that woman had taken it upon herself. She does the toilets. No one does it for her. But she didn't come yesterday. And Moa came first. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, I've never prayed that hard in my life for others to join. Because my brother also is in that team. When I saw him, I was so happy I nearly hugged him. That at least you're clean. But I ended up with the toilets. And boy, I got home and I said, I'm not going to look at Sister Elizabeth the same way I used to look at her again. <laughs> In my eyes, she's grown 10 feet tall. When I see her, I'm just going to hug her big time. And I'll say, don't go away again, please. <laughs> you know, let's put it this way. If everyone gave generously, if everyone gave according to their own resources and income, there will be more than enough for the work of each local church. There will be more than enough to pay staff, you know, to honor people, to put on, you know, uh, 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 events that are free for our elderly folks. You know, we talk about um, the food bank. Food don't just rock into the bank. No. Some people buy it and put it there. Some people give, you know, to put that food there. And we see, we just read now that when you give, you know, it, it, it's, the, the prayer is like two ways. First, people thank God. And then they, you know, they thank you. Then they thank God. And the prayer comes to you. You know, you are blessed. You, are, you know, I've not, come, I've not come to see the food bank in action. But I can just imagine the smiles on people's faces when they come to take food, you know. And even the person giving it to them, they're packing it, even without food bank. Sometimes they put some things outside there. And the sister said, oh, sis, take, take bread now. Take, you know, and they're laughing and you know, smiling and all that. It's, there's something about giving that just makes you feel good, you know. And also, although generosity is you know, often associated with money, um, but it extends beyond money. It includes small acts of kindness. It includes compassion, you know, friendliness, befriending, you know, those who are even unfriendly, you know, being there for someone, you know, picking the phone to ask out how someone is, being a part of the community of God, reaching out to others, smiling at someone at, at work, even if they're asking, what are you smiling at? Yeah. You know, I don't see anything funny. It's like, it's a good day, and I'm, you know, I just feel like smiling. <laughs> you know, generosity is not something that comes later when you accumulate wealth. Some people say, oh, when I'm rich, I will help. When I've made some more money, I will help. I used to tell my sons, if you don't give now when you don't have much, honestly, even if you're earning millions, you're not going to be able to give a penny. Because you will always have a reason why you shouldn't do. Some things come up. This one's come there. Da, 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 da. It's not something you leave out 
whenever, wherever you are in life today. Generosity is not something that just shows up. It's a lifestyle that you cultivate. It's a decision that you make that this that I have is from God. And however he wants me to use it is how I will use it. Am I saying don't save? Am I saying don't be cautious? You know, I mean, uh, there are people, many beggars on the street, but I work in housing and I know that a lot of them, they are housed. They are on benefits, but they are on drugs. So when I see a young person, for instance, come up to me and say, and I, mean, I look at her and say, eh, so what is exactly is your problem? Are you disabled? I said no. Uh, can you walk? Because if you can, I can employ you to come and clean my house, and I'll pay you. Don't stand there begging. Go and do something. You know, but there are genuine needs around us. That's what our homes are for. Some of us have three, four, five bedroom houses, and we only sleep in one bedroom. And there may be someone in here, even in this, our own family, that can't pay their rent. They're going to lose their property. Maybe we don't know, but we can always ask because yeah. the church knows. Yeah. We, cannot, we, we may not even need to ask. We can just give and say, if there is a need there, can this go towards it? Or I have space in my house. We took on a project 18 months ago when a very close family friend was diagnosed with cancer. And it was like me and my husband just said, well, okay, this is our project. She's going to have to stay with us and we're going to look after her and all, all that. It would have cost her a lot to go and rent. But it's not so much what it will cost her, but that being with family, that having someone to talk to, someone to give you a hug, someone to, you know, just, just share the word with you, to encourage you to go through that battle with you. And we don't know. It may be our turn tomorrow to need. Yeah. And that's why the Bible says what you sow is what you reap. Generous people in our culture today, they're no different from the generous people mentioned in the Bible. We read, we've read the story, I mean, we know the story of the widow of uh, Zarephath, for instance, Zarephath who um, gave her last bit of food to um, Elijah. We know the Shunammite woman who was always opening her home to Elisha. We know of Joseph of Arimathea who gave up his tomb for Jesus Christ. We know of the churches of Macedonia who were always um, helping other churches. Sharing what we have, no matter how big or small, is the simplest expression of generosity. I don't know how to encourage you this morning other than to say, give, 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 and keep giving. Amen. You can never exhaust God's abundance for you by giving. Let me finish with this. Generosity is not just a nice thing to do. It is, in fact, the gospel at work. All of all that Jesus proves or shows all his life was he gave and he gave and he gave. Generosity is the power to invest in what cannot be taken away from you. When you invest in eternity, no one can take that away from you. You may make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. You have not lived at all until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. And I finally finish on this quote. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the 
gift of life and the life that we have in Christ Jesus. We don't take anything for granted. The much that we've heard today, oh Lord, Father Lord, may it grow and bear fruits in our lives to bring forth the kind, oh Lord, that heavens will applaud in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So go ahead. Go out there and be generous. Last Sunday, I was giving the statistics by the staff about VBS, and we had a, I mean, it's a very busy church, I don't need to tell you that. So we had several things going on, and uh, it was about the statistics of a number of children that came through, and then the food bank. And um, when I mentioned that we distributed uh, supplies to 57 families, there's a young lady that was sitting there at the back um, in the second service. By the time I got home, I got a message from her. She said, Pastor, can I have the church's bank accounts? I want to donate 500 pounds to anyone who is in need. In other words, and another story. I mean, I, I can just go on, but I don't need to bore you with all these. But it's an, it's a, these testimonies are encouragement. Talking about the cleaning team. Years ago, it was during Pastor Derek's ministry here as a senior pastor. And there's a young lady that we buried, um, had buried uh, when we first came into this new building. Sadly, some of you remember her. And she's had a child, a first child, but not, she wasn't becoming pregnant. Somehow, she felt led to join the cleaning team and to take it upon herself to clean the toilets. It didn't take too long. I don't know how God works. But she became pregnant, and she kept cleaning. Then she shared that testimony with a friend of hers, and I know this friend of hers who was a pastor's wife, and they've been married for more than 10 years and no child. So she invited, and this person goes to another church, but she took it upon herself to start coming to join her to clean the toilet here. The, I know the child, it didn't take too long that she became pregnant. <laughs> then she told another person, some of you know the story I'm talking about, guys. This person who has been married for over 10 years, no child, a pastor's wife, they got pregnant. The child is beautiful. I can mention the name. I know this, the family history. She became pregnant. Then she told another person. So he started going around, go and clean in Elim, and if you can't have a child, <laughs> glory be to God. Amen. We were at uh, someone's 50th birthday party, and uh, we were just talking about this subject myself and my sister, because they sat us together in this sofa there. And she said this about you, Mr. Bancoli Thomas. She said, if it wasn't for her at times restraining you, you even give up your house. <laughs> that's, a, that's a heart of generosity. And to testify about a husband that way, and I thank God that you are here listening to this, that I know also the reverse. I know the opposite. When at times I'm thinking, if only you can just open your hands for God to put something in it. I talk about Eliza of Damascus, the servant of Abraham, going to find a wife for his master's son. He goes with wealth. And I always say that if you meet that man or if that man is chasing you and they are stingy, run a thousand miles from them. If they cannot impress you with generosity at the time they, they fancy you, once they get you, they're not going to open their wallet. I can assure you. Eliza went and showed off, as we do these days, these young people that are conducting their weddings, as they do, they really go. And, and that's a good thing. But you see the heart of Rebecca, someone who didn't call home and said, Dad, I've met a stranger. Can I bring him home? He said, we got fodder. We got room. Not only, it wasn't just Eliza of Damascus. Who, he comes with camels and other servants. Shouldn't she have contacted home first to make sure that, be, that I believe that their, their, their spirit of generosity was in that house? That's the reason why of all the girls in that locality, she was the one that was chosen to be married to that rich man. Think about that. Sometimes I want to get some of the singles in the church and take you away to a retreat and teach you how to get a good husband. <laughs> <laughs> 
the, the truths are there. <laughs> it's all. <laughs> and the men as well. The opposite is also true. I haven't got time to give you my, my many, many illustrations. You cannot go wrong with generosity. As our sister said, there are those who have got, there was a young lady who is still part of the church. One, one room, and she divided it, and she was having cell group on one half of the room. One room. In the same way, there are those with five rooms, four rooms, who say, we can't have cell group in our house. It's my house. Really? Come and let me show you the number of coffins and caskets that have opened here, and they've never taken one room, not one brick. Here in this church, someone dying, leaving their house, not too far from here, in, the, in their world for this church. Talk about generosity. So I can talk about both, but that is a really good appetizer for all of us to go and practice the word of God. Not just to be hearers only, deceiving ourselves, but to do, to be doers of God's word. By the way, you said, uh, um, I talk about the subject of money being delicate. Yes, it used to be delicate for me, but for now, I don't apologize again. This is, this is your testimony. God challenged me. He said, son, and I was nervous. I don't shy away from saying that. But for now, give me any platform. Ask me to talk about it. I will talk with it with megaphone. Because I know it works. Amen? Amen. It it has worked for me, it has worked for some of you, and it will work for anyone who will practice it. To the glory of his precious name we pray. Would you like to stand? Father, we just want to thank you for the dispensing of your word, your precious word. Our sister didn't speak outside of the Bible. She dished out your word. And we thank God for that. We We thank you for her life her husband's life, her children's life, the work of her hands, and her spirit of generosity. Bless her and bless all of us, those that are giving in secret, those that are giving their time, their substance, their rooms, their everything. Father, you are the rewarder. And you see all these things, especially those that give in secret. Father, reward them and let their treasury be full of overflow in their credit on earth here and also in heaven. Let us see a transformation in our lives as we practice what has been dished unto us this morning. And so we bless you, God. We pray for those that might be traveling this week, those who might be coming back. Would you carry us as on eagles' wings in our going out and our coming? Watch over us. Watch over that which we place before us in terms of food, water, interactions. Watch over us. Cover us with the blood and restore us when our time comes. Those who are facing medical challenges, you, you have promised to heal us as we call upon you. And we trust you. We honor you in the mighty name of Jesus. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, now and always. Amen. Amen. Let's give glory to God. Hallelujah.